Welcome. Welcome to another episode of Living on Crypto. Today, my guest is Warren Gray from currency.co.za. Uh, he's from South Africa, and he's agreed to join us to answer a few questions on what it's like to live on crypto in South Africa. Warren, how are you? Thanks for coming on the show. Great. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. I'm pretty well. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, Warren, my first question for you is, what is the Bitcoin and crypto community like in South Africa? It's actually surprisingly well developed here. Um, I think there's a host of factors which we'll probably get into later with some of your other questions, but I think we are one of the uh, very active uh, crypto communities in the world relative to our population size. I think that's a mix of the kind of exchange controls we've had as well as our currency being quite volatile. Um, and a lot of people don't necessarily have faith in it. Uh, so I think um, crypto assets are seen as something that a lot of people have quite a big interest in. I know probably the most famous crypto person from South Africa is Fluffy Pony, the former Monero maintainer. Um, besides yeah. him, like what other South African crypto projects are there that we might know about? Uh, we have kind of our own Bitcoin beach here um, on the South Coast. Uh, there's something called Project Ekazi. Um, so... Uh, that's uh, a project to try and get a lot of people in that area in the in the township to use uh, crypto assets, accept those payments a lot, like some of the original projects uh, we saw in El Salvador predating their um, use of it as a nationally recognized currency. Um, and then there are a number of uh, people, I guess, like Ryan Neuner, who are known quite well, um, have their own show kind of thing um in the south african context but we don't i don't think we have a lot of very big projects per se it's just that there are quite a lot of, of businesses here that uh, use crypto in some way or another or are building financial instruments um into the crypto ecosystem earlier you mentioned the volatility of the currency it, is the south african rand um being devalued like like we've seen in other places maybe not as bad as like venezuela or turkey but um is that like a issue that the people are dealing with there in the long term our currency the rand has lost quite a lot of value against um you know the global reserve currencies um it's it has actually held up quite well compared to a lot of other emerging market currencies i think uh you know we we have reasonably good monetary policy. I mean, if you're going to have some kind of money printing, you may as well keep it low, right? Everyone does it. All governments do it. Ours is, we have an inflation targeting policy. So um, they try and keep inflation at a certain level, but that really just means there's, you know, five, six, seven percent um, being inflated every year. As a result, I think in the long run, our currency does have a long um, reduction in value against global currencies. However, there is always the risk that the political situation could change. And I think that's what a lot of people worry about is it's fine for now, but to what extent do you trust that that will continue to be the case? So if, if um, you never know what could happen with any government, same as here, and one of the things that could change like it has in other countries around the world is suddenly there could be rampant money printing and bad monetary policy, which could lead to the complete erosion of, of savings. What can you tell us about currency? Uh, I know that's your project. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, I think one of the biggest um, industries involving crypto assets in South Africa is is arbitrage. Um, so what we do is we um, we effectively provide a form of of arbitrage. So most countries in the world don't have exchange control. There's only a few really that that have quite a strict exchange control, and something that in South Africa, most people don't realize is that companies cannot actually buy Forex. So businesses can't buy Forex for the purpose of procuring crypto assets um, internationally. So as we said earlier, South Africa has actually got quite a big uh, crypto industry, crypto enthusiasts and community. A lot of people use it. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, where is the crypto that they're using coming from bought on our local exchanges? And if you look at our local exchanges, they do have very high volumes actually. So we don't have a big mining industry here. I've, before this project, I was involved in some, some Bitcoin mining and you realize it's actually a very small industry. So there's not much 
um, Bitcoin being mined here for sale on the local markets. And similar, we don't have lots of old hodlers um, who are selling off their coins. We just can't provide that kind of volume. Um, if you look at the amount of, of Bitcoin and other crypto assets being bought locally. So what happens in South Africa is we have this very unique situation where only individuals in South Africa, so South African citizens have a relatively small allowance every year to, to procure um, Bitcoin and other assets, crypto assets overseas on international markets. So we effectively run a company that enables people to do that because you've obviously got to hedge out all the positions. You can't go and send dollars over there, wait for that, buy Bitcoin, wait for that to come back in. You know, in that time, those things can move against you in quite a big way. So we effectively provide a service that has uh, software uh, to enable this, as well as um, hedging capital that enables uh, clients to have no risk in um, financial price movement against them in the time that they are doing the, the arbitrage. And the arbitrage is quite high. We usually see anything from three, um, you know, in the past, it's been as high as in recent years, 8%. Um, so we have, uh, you know, that is a very big arbitrage between liquid markets where you're just moving financial assets between them. Uh, so they, and it, it's been quite interesting because it's really hard to maintain exchange control, strict exchange control like we have, which is a policy that predates, um, you know, our current government. It's a very old policy from the 1960s, actually. Um, it's largely unchanged. It's really hard to maintain that in the world of, of crypto assets. I don't know who said it, but I, I've heard someone say that trying to police exchange control in a world where Bitcoin exists is a bit like trying to police immigration border control in a world where you have teleporters. So I think that we're kind of seeing exchange control being subverted in a big way where individuals are incentivized through making a very high profit of arbitrage um, to use these allowances of theirs to bring billions of dollars of crypto into the country every year and by implication, sending billions of rand out of the country to procure these assets. Um, so it's been quite an interesting thing to see how large the volumes are. I mean, I, I know that at some of the biggest banks in the country, their Forex desks, in some cases, more than half of their total Forex volume is just um, individuals sending our currency out to buy dollars, to buy Bitcoin, to bring back here. So it's not a small thing by any means, but it, it really has organically grown and is being done by individuals. Wow, that's extremely interesting. Um, do you guys foresee like the regulators of the, of the country like updating the, these kind of outdated uh, capital control laws for, for exchanges like at any point in the near future? It's going to be interesting which way they go. So they could uh, fight it, I think, temporarily. Um, or they could uh, kind of accept that exchange control probably is doing more harm than good. I mean, there's obviously winners and losers. Our currency will most likely lose a lot of value quickly, like it has in countries where exchange control has kept the currency at an artificial level. Um, however, I think in the long run, a lot of people are reticent to invest here. So there are a lot of groups in the world that potentially lend money to South Africa. They don't really like uh, us having exchange control. Um, I mean, there are obviously a lot of vested interests. Uh, so what we're seeing is there are moves for our local exchanges to have to report on these old systems, um, these old exchange control systems. So whether that happens or not uh, remains to be seen. I mean, at the moment, you can buy an unlimited amount of, of crypto assets in South Africa. Um, however, there's a limit as to how much forex you can buy as an individual. Um, so they are looking at trying to include in that allowance. Um, I don't know how that'll work. I don't think it will be successful, uh, but it could really go one of two ways. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping kind of philosophically and for, for the country and for the adoption of, of Bitcoin that we go the way of getting rid of exchange control. But, you know, our arbitrage business wouldn't exist if it was there. So I'm a bit torn, you know, it's nice to have the business going and it's fun. But in reality, in the long run, it'll be way better for, for us if we don't have that those kinds of laws in place. And I think Bitcoin will ultimately be the undoing of, of exchange control probably all around the world on, on a long enough timeline. What about stable coins like uh, USDC or USDT? How, how has that impacted this uh, like crypto arbitrage uh, industry? So we actually, originally we minted uh, or we procured Bitcoin 
abroad, but um, we then sort of pivoted our business to uh, work entirely with stable coins. So we use, we use USDC and we mint them directly with Circle one-to-one -one, uh, for our clients. Um, it just means you don't have to hedge out the Forex component um, in, in quite the same way. You can do it uh, without having full reserves as it were. So um, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to bring in, in stable coins rather. However, the markets, we've only recently had stable coin rammed markets um, with our, our local currency. So there still is a Bitcoin leg to that transaction. Um, so at the moment, there's a huge amount. In fact, it's a few percentage points of the total USDC supply ever has been minted through individuals buying stable coins through this arbitrage um, process. It's not an insignificant amount, um, but it's it's something probably between two and four percent. I would I would guess I can check it out. But I mean, it's a very high percentage if you look at the total amount of USDC that's that's uh, in circulation, and a sizable portion of that came purely from individuals from this little country on the tip of Africa. Yeah, that that's impressive that it's that much considering that USDC is global. Um, aside from uh, your exchange currency, which which is kind of more focused on arbitrage, like what are the most popular exchanges that people are using to um, buy crypto? Like if I wanted to just get some Bitcoin or, or purchase a little bit of Ethereum or something, are people using exchanges like Luno or are they kind of following the trend of using Binance because it's the largest exchange and it's available everywhere? Well, we don't, Binance doesn't have a fiat on-ramp in South Africa. Um, so Binance is very small here. Uh, Luna and Vala are both really good exchanges. And they, they're really world-class. They've got a huge amount of funding behind them. I know that um, Vala just raised another $50 million um, from, I think, mostly abroad. And uh, yeah, those exchanges are great. And they're really good teams. They're very easy to use, lots of liquidity. Uh, so we don't really, we can't really use Binance with the the uh, the local currency. So I think the, the volumes on Binance locally are pretty low. Um, however, I guess people that are trading, uh, you know, altcoins, et cetera, they most likely would go there. I mean, having said that the fees are really low on the South African exchanges, they're actually lower than Binance. I think there's been a bit of a fee war uh, going on. Um, so, uh, it's great for the consumers. I wonder, it must, it must be quite hard to run these local exchanges, even though their volumes are high. Um, but I guess it incentivizes them to build products on top of the, you know, the ecosystem, which is the exchange. They can start to build lending and staking products, et cetera, and, and maybe money transmission, which I think is a big reason why they've been raising a lot of money is investors see these as really good springboards into the money remittance market throughout the rest of Africa. That's that's actually super interesting too. Is is South Africa kind of like a hub for for sending remittances to to other African nations? Yeah, absolutely. We have um, there's a lot of uh, migrant workers and uh, immigrants in South Africa from other African countries, and they invariably do need to send money home. Now, the services that exist, um, I don't know if they are nefarious or just that the the currency markets that operate between are quite illiquid, but the fees of sending funds back, um, often 15%, uh, just to get money back to a neighboring country, which is which is crazy. You can imagine 15% of your labor has to go into just paying for the remittance, send money home. Uh, there was quite an interesting case where there used to be an exchange in Zimbabwe called Golix, and they had even more extreme exchange control. And so many people wanted to move money out, but the, the premium there was. 10 or 15 percent above uh, what it was even in South Africa for Bitcoin. So people could actually remit money home. They'd send $100 and 110 would show up back in Zimbabwe on, on using Golix as a, a rail to get out there. Um, unfortunately, uh, their Reserve Bank took the view of being completely hostile to, to crypto. But I guess uh, the saying goes, if you ban the future, it just happens somewhere else. So it's unfortunate. It was a great team from Zimbabwe who built that up, like a really good story of entrepreneurs, and it was just closed down by old institution. Um, so, uh, hopefully, uh, the, the South African exchanges can 
make inroads up into Africa and solve that problem again, because there was already a solution in place, which really was just having crypto exchanges in all these countries with uh, fairly liquid markets would completely subvert the, the existing fiat remittance model. Everyone would just go and use crypto exchanges to send funds between themselves. With all these migrant workers and stuff, is, is there like a healthy peer-to-peer -peer market? Like are people using local Bitcoins or anything similar? I don't think there is a big peer-to-peer -peer market here. There might be a few uh, large-ish OTC trades where someone might have a lot of cash or, um, I don't know, they, they want to maybe move money a little bit off grid or whatever, whatever reason. But I think um, it's so easy to use our exchanges um, that, and they are very accessible. Um, that, at least to my knowledge, we don't really have a big OTC uh, scene the way in countries where you don't have good exchange infrastructure. I know, for example, Kenya has quite a lot of good um, OTC um, and peer-to-peer uh, -peer options out there. Um, because the exchanges haven't really been able to operate that efficiently because of, again, banking regulations. Uh, so we don't really have a, a big peer-to-peer -peer market, at least not to my knowledge. Or the is the average citizen, like bank, do they have access to the banking infrastructure in South Africa? Or is it uh, one of those places like El Salvador where like the majority of the citizens don't have bank accounts? I think, it, I don't know the exact numbers, but the impression I get is South African citizens have very easy access to bank accounts, relatively speaking. Our banking sector is actually quite good as much as I don't like banks. You know, obviously if you're in Bitcoin, <laughs> I'm not gonna usually be a fan of them, but um, as they go, we have got quite a good uh, setup here compared to most countries similar to our own. However, I think if you, if you are a immigrant working here, it is a lot harder to get a bank account because you invariably need some kind of ID or proof of address, it's not always as easy to come by. Um, and in, in those cases, I think there's, there's quite a big opportunity, but I think it'd be great if we had more projects and it might be something worth starting actually is, is just trying to, to um, teach people specifically how they could use, use crypto. Um, I mean, for example, a product like BitRefill is really a good way for them to potentially be paid um, and then go and spend those funds in the shop without having to uh, get a, a bank account, which they might struggle to get. What are the regulations like for, for crypto businesses? Like if I wanted to start a, a business and have like a crypto component, is there a strict uh, regulatory regime that I have to comply with? It's actually completely unregulated now, which is, is quite crazy, but there are, um, well, I think it's great, but it's surprising it's been unregulated for so long. So there are um, some regulations in the pipeline um, they, they're trying to introduce this kind of regulation called the crypto asset service provider or a crypto asset trading platform. Um, and then re probably require some kind of reporting and KYC, et cetera. But I think the approach that the, the South African crypto exchanges and crypto companies have taken is for them to, um, effectively front run the regulation. So they do KYC people are being required to. They do run AML checks, et cetera. Um, so, but at the moment, what's interesting is that the, the South African crypto exchanges are completely unregulated. They don't have any licenses, um, even though they have uh, a huge amount of, of funds and uh, crypto and uh, fiat currency with their bank accounts, but they, they, um, they don't have any kind of uh, license at the moment. And I do think it takes a very long time for these licenses to come about. So even though it's been promised uh, continually, we've kind of been hearing about it for years. I think it will still be a few years before it actually promulgates. Uh, with the high level of adoption, and it seems like the, the citizens are kind of forward thinking towards crypto, how common is it to um, pay with Bitcoin like at some sort of business? Uh, are there lots of businesses that accept Bitcoin or crypto or Lightning? Sadly, it isn't. Um, and it is something that I, I tried to to do a few years ago was to try and get um, payments in, but I wasn't really well positioned to, to do that in, in retail, et cetera. There are a handful of um, places where you can use it directly with the, the end user, but it tends to be um, for larger purchases. So there might be a few high-end motor car dealerships who are um, maybe just doing it for a bit of PR. And so sadly, we don't 
often see QR codes around um, at coffee shops and things like that. Uh, so I think it is a function of us having access to very easy access to banking systems. So it's not not really an immediate need. And I think for most people that are using Bitcoin in South Africa, it is more the store of value component it isn't the transactional one at the moment. Um, but I think over time that'll most likely most likely change. We we actually our biggest online retailer used to accept um, Bitcoin. So there's a company called Take a Lot. It's kind of our Amazon, and they used to accept um, Bitcoin as payments. Um, but this predates Lightning. And they were quite forward thinking at it, and unfortunately they stopped that a couple of years ago. Uh, but that was a great one, um, being able to use them for for um, uh, anyone who like myself, you know, earns Bitcoin. That was a really, really handy service. Sadly went away. Yeah, I wonder if it was because the it, during the last bull run in 2018, 2017, the fees were um, pretty high. So I, I remember a lot of businesses that accepted Bitcoin mm. kind of got rid of it during that time. Um, I think that was a big part of it. Yeah. As well as the block time, you know, not having lightning, et cetera, at the time. Uh, there were issues with double spins and uh, things not confirming in time and setting too low fees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, Project Ikazi, and recently Steve uh, sent us some videos of the server kids using lightning to buy gift cards and top up phones and stuff. Uh, what can you tell us about that project? Uh, are you familiar with it? In at all? I'm uh, probably not uh, familiar enough to, to talk too much about it. I just know that um, it, it's something that I would, it, it's not too far from where I stay um, on the South Coast. So it's somewhere I would like to actually go across to soon and see if we can do something similar here uh, to, to tie in that, that kind of model where uh, people start to get paid in Bitcoin and then at the same time creating places where they would shop to accept it. So you sort of build up that ecosystem from a small a small uh, nucleus, I guess. Um, but I don't know too much beyond that. That's kind of the intention is to both create the payments uh, for individuals taking their funds in, in, in Bitcoin, as well as setting up uh, the places where they would spend their money to accept it. So hopefully creating the, you know, people that can further teach how to replicate that model. Yeah, I've, I've never um, had the opportunity to visit Bitcoin Beach in El Zonte, but uh, from what I understand, it's a, it's a pretty small little town and it kind of got the whole country um, having their eyes on Bitcoin, which led to the legal tender mm -hmm. law. So um, I'm Everyone not sure. Same, yeah, yeah something, something similar. <laughs> um, another question I have for you is, have you ever encountered like a Bitcoin ATM in like a shopping center in South Africa? Like, are they common or are they pretty rare? We have encountered them. They they aren't that common. Um, there used to be a a number of smaller ones that were run out of small retail chain. Um, and what was crazy about them is that they were actually when you did go and buy Bitcoin on them, you would get the international rate. In other words, you're getting a rate that at the time was probably six percent. It was quite interesting that it, it lasted that long. Um, but the they, I think they, they stopped uh, running them. And at the moment, there are a couple of, of Bitcoin ATMs around, but they, they, there's a massive spread on it. So you get such a high cost per Bitcoin uh, when you go and use them that I've never actually seen anyone using them. Uh, but they do, I, I tested them out for fun a couple of times, but then you, you're sort of paying a 30% premium or something on, on the Bitcoin. I just think there isn't too, too good a balance of the buys and sells on there. I'm not really sure why there's such a high, high price on them. You mentioned that South Africa has a, a premium in general, like on the exchange prices. Uh, like with that premium, do, do people see that as like a negative thing or are they happy about it because of the arbitrage opportunities? I guess uh, you know, anyone that does arbitrage is going to like that, but it isn't really good. It's hard to build these remittance models where you've got to pay a premium to get into the asset. Um, so. I think it's, it is pretty bad for adopting any other um, services built on top of Bitcoin in South Africa. And in fact, maybe in a roundabout way, it might be a reason that people don't tend to pay with Bitcoin that much here because they invariably would have had to 
pay a premium to get it in the first place. Um, so I think, um, you know, Bitcoin just has this way of breaking down these barriers to being adopted. And I think for us, the first step is really getting and completely subverting exchange control and capital control so that uh, we can get that parity with the international price. And therefore, um, you can have a far more, more liquid local market uh, with regard to, to spending uh, crypto assets and building other services on top of it. Does that premium also extend to altcoins like uh, Ethereum, yeah. for example? And stable coins. I mean, every, and the reason for it is if, if there was any crypto asset that didn't have the premium, you could, with virtually you no know, cost and friction arbitrage between that market and buy implication, you'd put the price up by putting so much buy pressure on the coin that didn't have the premium and selling on the big um, Bitcoin exchange market. So um, because that premium exists, for the supply and demand reason of you can't, you know, companies can't buy crypto assets. They can't throw, hedge funds can't throw billions of dollars at performing the arbitrage functions that they do around uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we, we always have that premium on all assets and it can't exist um, in, uh, in one crypto asset class and not another because it would, you know, those, those markets, there's no uh, volume limitations. They would, that difference would be armed away and it would just go towards the parity of the, the, the effectively the big market Bitcoin brand arbitrage premium. Is there anything else that I uh, haven't asked you that you feel is important for people to know about uh, living on crypto in South Africa? Um, I think one thing that is interesting is there are a number of OTC desks that you can use to make payments. Um, so, you know, if you, if you did want to, to do a, a larger payment, you might be able to find, I think there are a number of smaller businesses out there where you could actually go and use them as a third party payment provider to uh, pay them and then uh, uh, they'll or pay them in Bitcoin and then they'll make the payment for you. So for example, if you wanted to buy a motorcycle, um, but you didn't want to go and sell on an exchange because I think a lot of people are aware that exchanges, I mean, they invariably have a degree of risk that's associated with them, but they also are going to be a place that authorities are going to go look at, you know, from a tax, uh, et cetera, perspective. So there are massive privacy concerns. Um, even if you are completely law-abiding, you could get caught up in, in all kinds of um, uh, laws that are invented in the future that you didn't foresee when you were selling on the exchange, which already has happened in, in our own country, where originally, uh, crypto to crypto trades were not considered taxable events and that was changed recently so you know if three years ago you were trading ethereum and bitcoin um under the understanding then that it was not a capital gains event now that's been changed so there are reasons to stay off exchanges um, and i'm seeing a lot of uh, services cropping up that enable you to make those kinds of of payments which is, is good for larger larger payments uh, because you know services like like bitrefill um, they, they're going to target more the mass market stores, which is great for the majority of volume. But if you want to buy a house or something like that, or a car or anything, you know, that's a bit more expensive and bespoke, it's a bit harder to, to uh, do that in any other way without going through an exchange, unless the buyer is going to accept Bitcoin, which is very rare to, to see, unfortunately, at the moment. Is there any sort of service like BlockFi or, or these crypto lending services that we see where you kind of put your coins up for collateral and then you can get a, a loan in fiat? I'm told these are coming soon. Um, so I believe our local exchanges and maybe some other providers are working on providing um, lending uh, Bitcoin uh, backed loans in RAND, which I think is very exciting for people who are uh, living off of, of crypto assets. Um, and there's also a bit of a gray area on exchange control that says that you can't take a loan that's denominated outside of the country um, in, a, in a foreign currency. Um, but it's not very clear as to uh, whether that applies to crypto assets. So, you know, I do use BlockFi and I have gone and, and taken loans on BlockFi and other um, lending protocols. Uh, however, it's not actually very clear where that sits in our exchange control law. And it is a a difficult thing to to police i suppose um, because it, it is quite easy to go and, and block five services south africa so you know you can easily go and put your bitcoin up take usdc 
um, Arbit in through exchanges and you even get a premium on your loan because of the arbitrage. And then you can use that to go and buy your house or, or whatever it is you're after. Um, so, but I do think those, those services are coming soon. What about um, like DeFi lending protocols? I know there's like, um, you know, these kind of like smart contract loans where you kind of do a similar thing. You wrap your Bitcoin and, and put it up and then they lend you like stable coins. Um, do, are people adopting those since there's um, not a whole lot of other options? Um, yeah, I think there is quite a big uh, DeFi community in South Africa. I know that we have, uh, I mean, to your, one of your earlier questions about famous South African projects brings Andre Krenya to mind, who was um, very involved in creating some of the, the DeFi projects um, that are out there. And um, yeah, I think they, they do use it. And then that also becomes a very interesting question. You know, like if you, if you aren't, if you're not supposed to take a foreign loan, what is a DeFi, like, you know, there's no domicile on a DeFi protocol. So where is that loan coming from? So again, that's a way that uh, crypto seems to be subverting this nature of domiciled currencies and, and the law around international currencies. Well, Warren, thank you very much for, for coming on the show and answering all my questions. Um, how can people find you? How can they find currency? How can they follow you on Twitter if they want to? Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm not actually that active on social media and Twitter, so probably not too much to, to follow out there. But uh, I do have a Twitter profile. It's, it's at Warrener, W-A-R-I-N-E-R, occasionally uh, tweet something or two. But, um, and then currency, uh, just on, on the website. If you are in South Africa, um, it's a good way to earn an extra income. It's a good way to bring more crypto in South Africa. Um, so you can go and, and check that out there. Well, thank you very much for, for accepting the interview and coming on the show. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thank you.